Great, and I think we, it's time to get started. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the sixth webinar in the Creating Communities of Welcome series on cultural orientation. Many of you here today have taken the ultimate step of becoming a welcomer by committing to sponsoring a newcomer, navigating cultural differences and helping newcomers integrate into the new communities is one of the most important roles sponsors will play. This webinar will help you to understand the phases of cultural adjustment and help newcomers navigate American culture so that they are set up for success in their new communities. Next. Welcome.us is was founded in September 2021 in response to the Afghanistan um, crisis, and we have since moved um, to include as well the Ukrainian um, crisis. Um, our mission is to inspire and empower people from across divides to unite in common person purpose and welcome newcomers, meet their essential needs, and help them thrive. We are very honored to have four former presidents and first ladies as our honorary co-chairs. My name is Denise Bell, and I head up partnerships here at Welcome.us. I am honored to be a co-founder of the organization um, from September 2021. And so we have a few pieces of housekeeping. Um, today's webinar is being recorded. The chat feature is disabled. You may submit a question at any time using the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar. toolbar. The Q&A is being monitored um, and we will be live, um, answering questions at the end. Um, to keep this event a safe and supportive environment for all participants, we will remove attendees who engage in any form of harassing, offensive, discriminatory or threatening speech or behavior. And with that, I am thrilled to introduce um, Jamie Busey, who is the Director of the Cultural Orientation Resource Exchange at the, Interal, at the International Rescue Committee. Uh, welcome, Jamie. It's great to see you here. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. Um, and so with that, I'd love to jump in. I know that we're going to have a lot of Q&A, so I, I want to make sure that you have time to, to tell us what you know. Um, could you tell us about your organization, the International Rescue Committee, and the Cultural Orientation Resource Exchange? Yeah, of course. Um, thanks again for having me. As uh, Jamie said, my name is Jamie Bussey. I'm the director for the Cultural Orientation Resource Exchange. This is a uh, project, a technical assistance project that has operated for over seven years. You may hear me say CORE throughout the presentation. So that's the, the short version of Cultural Orientation Resource Exchange. So we're primarily funded by the Department of State and specifically the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration. And CORE is a project under the International Rescue Committee. Um, so the IRC, you guys may be familiar with, uh, we are an international nonprofit. We respond to crises around the world. Um, we've resettled more than 400,000 uh, refugees and other newcomers. Um, from over 100 nationalities, and in the past year, we were essential in the processing and, and departure of over 74,000 Afghans. So you may be familiar with the IRC. It's a very large organization. CORE is one part of the IRC. Um, so what does CORE do? We have really two, uh, I always describe kind of two buckets of work. Um, the first is that we provide training and resources to help guide those who are helping newcomer, newcomers adjust to their life with a specific focus on cultural orientation. Um, so that includes webinars, um, curriculum, lesson plans, and a lot of that work is really guided by the State Department and sort of the requirements of what cultural orientation programming is as a part of a service provided both before refugees come to the United States and once they arrive. Um, and that's really sort of a traditional um, kind of approach. The second part of our work at CORE is that we provide digital platforms and information services to newcomers to access directly. And that body of work started about 2016 with the Syrian crisis, with the growth of technology, misinformation, and really wanting to make sure we provide a space where newcomers can find trustworthy, accurate information that's in language. Um, so I'm going to drop um, 
two links into the chat. Um, the first is going to be that link to the core website. And I'll, I'll be sharing more links throughout um, answering some of the questions, but these are sort of the two jumping off points. So that first link has resources, training materials. I'll go into more details for some of those things. The second is the settle in work, which is settle in is everything that newcomers can access directly. So we have a website, we have an app. Um, we did launch um, last year for Afghans a settle in Facebook, and we're looking to launch a similar project for Ukrainians in the, um, in the next couple months. Um, so that's a little bit about core and a little bit about IRC, um, Denise. So hope that hope that gives a little bit of a teaser, but I look forward to answering um, some of the other more detailed questions. Thank you, Jamie. I think that was a great answer. Um, and now we'll go um, and setting us up for our next question, um, which you can answer so well. Newcomers arrive in the US with a wealth of cultural experiences, values, and norms that may differ from those in their communities, new communities. What are the key things that sponsors should be aware of as they welcome newcomers? Yeah, this is a great question. And I, I, I'm gonna unpack a little bit, but there's so much that we could talk about within this question. And I think what I, I'd like to start with is a little bit of a little bit of story to kind of help identify some of the key components that sponsors should uh, be aware of when they're welcoming newcomers. So early on in my, um, I've been working in this field for over 10 years now. And early on, I did employment services and I uh, would onboard interns. And I remember this particular time I was working with an intern and I was reviewing with them the process of how to create a resume with a client, you know, with a refugee. Um, you know, we call them clients a lot of times. So you might hear me say the word client. Um, so at one point when I'm talking through sort of how to go through filling out the, the resume, the intern turned to me and said, well, so what are their stories? Like, do we ask them about, you know, what happened to them, where they came, you know, where they came, you know, came from? And I had to answer emphatically, no. I mean, sort of what the intern was getting at was wanting to get some of that background and that history. And that's not to say that when doing services and working with newcomers, you won't hear stories, you won't um, be, be told about their past experiences, but we really, um, those are gonna come out sort of organically. And they, you also have to be very conscious about how asking cer certain questions might be triggering. So, you know, we take that resume example, there's definitely gonna be things that might come up. I used to work with a lot of Afghans who are interpreters and I'd start filling out the resume and we'd have to create bullet points and, you know, it would come out some of the things that they, it's interesting that they're called interpreters because when you hear their stories, they definitely did a lot more than like interpretation. So those things are going to come out, but you don't want to, you, you have to be really careful about how you draw, you know, how that information comes out and how you handle it. And a lot of times the, when working with newcomers, that information comes out after there's been a sense of trust built and after some time, and it might actually happen in the most unexpected moment, especially when I was doing direct services, I might have back to back meetings with clients and a client might have be having a bad day and that's where some of this information comes out and you have to be really prepared to be present and with that person in that moment. And so that really brings me to three kind of key points that I think would be really helpful for sponsors to be aware of when welcoming newcomers, which is mindfulness, patience, and commitment. I think the other piece of this is looking at the process as a two-way street. Not only um, an awareness of what the newcomers are experiencing, what they might need to know, what they might need to be aware of, but also what you bring to that experience, what you bring to the interactions, um, because that is also important. We talk a lot about cultural orientation being a two-way street. Um, if this is, you know, to help a little bit with that kind of concept, I'm gonna drop another resource, which is we recently released this resource about how to apply cultural humility and cultural orientation. I think this is a really good primer to start thinking about how to welcome a newcomer, how to think about things like trauma, how to take um, a strengths-based approach. And so that's what I mean when I talk about there's a lot to unpack in this topic. There's a lot of different complexities because at the end of the day, we're, 
we're dealing with human beings and, and that's really, there's a lot that happens inside of that. And so I think it's just really important to take time to reflect and kind of be prepared for um, the, the unexpected. So I think that that resource is a good um, jumping off point. And then we also have a um, course on navigating identity inclusion, which I also think is a really great um, primer. So happy to answer questions later about how to access those resources. So th those are some of my quick tips. That's a long-winded way of saying, you know, patience, um, commitment, and uh, mindfulness are really important. And I, I really love that, um, particularly the mindfulness, right? To be very present and mindful and humble and um, that kindness as well, as we've all known. Um, so thank you for that, um, Jamie. Moving on to the next slide, we have a, a question. What are the phases of cultural adjustment and how should sponsors support newcomers in this process? Yeah, great question. Um, so we actually just released a great resource on this that's about cultural adjustment. And so what I'd love to do is actually play this video. So this video is explains cultural adjustment. It's a video that's actually been created for um, newcomers to uh, access directly. So we're gonna show the English version, but we also have a Ukrainian and a Russian version. And I think this is a great video that's gonna give us sort of a summary of cultural adjustment, and then I'll come back afterwards and highlight a couple key points. When you move to the United States, you may feel excited and nervous. As you settle into your new life in the United States, you will feel different phases of adjustment. There are four phases of cultural adjustment. The length and intensity of each phase are different. You may experience the same phase more than once or skip a phase. Honeymoon phase. You feel excited and happy about your life in the US. Culture shock phase. You feel worried and confused as you navigate a new and different community. Adjustment phase. You feel more stable in your new community. You are comfortable with everyday activities. Mastery phase. You feel more comfortable with your new life and culture. You still may have difficult periods, but you have a sense of belonging. As you adjust to your new life in the United States, use these tips to help you cope with stress and culture shock. Learn English to help you find a job, meet new people, and make friends. Find connections with others by going to community events, playing sports, or volunteering. Practice and share your cultural traditions. For example, cooking meals from your culture, practicing your religious beliefs, or playing music. Recognize that family dynamics may change. For example, children may adjust faster. Be patient and communicate openly and honestly with your family members. Learn some American social norms. For example, did you know that most Americans believe eye contact during a job interview shows respect? Be tolerant and respectful. In the United States, there are different races, religious views, cultures, and sexual orientations. It's important to respect others, even if they are different than you. It's important to remember that cultural adjustment is a process. It will take time to adjust to life in your new community. If you need more help, ask your resettlement agency. Thanks. So as we see in the video, I think one of the most important things to understand about the cultural adjustment process, there's typically when we talk about there's four phases, the, the honeymoon phase, uh, the mastery phase, um, the, uh, the, you know, there's the four phases, right? Sorry, I was just going back to the slide. The, um, the cult, you know, adjustment, but these, you know, they show up on the slide as a linear 
process, but in fact, they're not linear at all. And so I think one of the important things when you're thinking about cultural adjustment is to think about it in terms of it's going to it's going to go bouncing around and it will be different on different days and everybody experiences it differently. So, for example, um, you know, when we take, uh, I mean, use the, the Afghan context, because that's what we've really been the, in the thick of for the past year, a lot of the individuals that were evacuated, that was not a planned, that, that was not necessarily something they had planned for. And so really coming to the United States, they may have not experienced that initial excitement or honeymoon at all, because they were fleeing directly in that moment and some of them left their family behind they're worried so there might not be a honeymoon phase versus for example sometimes we have arrivals that are coming um, from areas where they've been in refugee camps for 15 20 years and there's a lot of excitement about coming to the united states because they've been waiting for so long um, but then once you arrive there can be a lot of back and forth of, oh, wow, this is much more challenging than I thought it was going to be. This is, uh, I, you know, what they what people envision the United States is going to be like, what resettlement is going to be like is very different than what it could be in reality. And so I think understanding that it's a process, it changes over time, everybody experiences it differently is really important. And it just really ties back into that mindfulness, the patience um, pieces I was talking about earlier. The last thing is, uh, in addition to this video, I'm going to drop in this resource that's about cultural adjustment. It has some different activities, has more guidance and tips about addressing cultural adjustment and discussion and some resources. So if you're interested in learning more about cultural adjustment, that's also a great resource. This is amazing, Jamie. There's so much information. Thank you. And you're, you're communicating it in, in a way that we can all understand that makes sense. Um, in the sense of any person who is a newcomer to a new community, there's always going to be adjustment. So thank you. And this chart is really fantastic. Um, following up on that, what are the key points about American culture that sponsors can communicate to newcomers? Yeah, this is a great question. And I think the slide has some really um, kind of good uh, high level things um, in terms of self-reliance, you know, the importance of finding a new job, finding your first job. Um, there's, there are, there is available public assistance, but it's limited. So this goes against self-reliance. The English acquisition, um, there's, as the video pointed to, there's things like, um, you know, eye contact, uh, the slide, punctuality, politeness. Those are all really great things to keep in mind in terms of um, communicating newcomers. But I think, honestly, I would also start with understanding what do the newcomers already know and not making assumptions. You will be surprised about some of the perceptions held and the variations on exposure to American culture that newcomers have from all different walks of life. And so this understanding what an individual or family already knows what they're um, what they what they think they know what, what information they already have is really important because if you're not aware of what they already know it can lead to mismanagement of expectations. Um, we often, um, for example, they might expect better housing. They might find think that finding a job is going to be really easy in their field. These are some of the common things. Making money is easy. I, I think one of the things that um, I've often heard from across multiple different populations is not realizing how expensive the cost of living in the United States is. And that is something that has not obvious, it has continued to be a challenge for, for everyday Americans and newcomers alike. So I think establishing understanding what they might know, um, what they've, what they've, you know, what they might know already about the United States is a really helpful space to start in, in order to start communicating about some of these concepts. Because if you go in first and say, okay, you gotta, you, you've got to find, you know, a first job and you say, okay, here's a job, take this job. And you don't understand what they might perceive about the job or their expectations that you can create a lot of conflict and tension by not first taking that step to develop that relationship and understand um, the individual. Um, there's actually a training exercise we've done in a training when we train staff around sort of concepts of uh, cultural adjustment, where uh, we define our own perceptions of what 
the American dream is. Um, and we actually look at uh, a clip of West Side Story and they're singing a song about they're going to have a washing machine and they're really excited about like that's what they that they think about when they're, you know, the American dream. And so I, I highlight that to say that sometimes the American dream is defined differently by each individual. And so I think that's an important place to start. I think the other thing is, and the video highlights this, is understanding the diversity, um, really understanding the diversity of the United States um, is, is really um, important. And, and just the variety within the communities, particularly when you have a mass amount of the same population coming in and they might have um, ties, family, friends who are living in other parts of the United States, it's going to be natural to be comparing or trying to understand why is why is this happening in this state or this community and this is something that's in this community. I think the richness and the diversity of the United States is something that's really um, can be difficult to wrap our heads around sometimes. So I think that's another um, value. So in addition to these great ones that are on the slide, those are a couple other pieces I would add to it. I, th this is so very helpful. And I liked how you like help us see ourselves too, for people who live in the United States, how people perceive ourselves, how people perceive us, how we might perceive ourselves and how we can bridge that. Um, so then moving on um, to the um, next question, from a cultural assimilation perspective, what are some of the most common challenges newcomers face when they are settling into a new life in the United States? Yeah, great question. I did want to, um, the first thing I want to be careful when we use the word assimilation. A lot of times um, when we talk about um, somebody joining into a new culture or a new country, we have, um, there's different phrases that we use. Um, and what we really, um, what we really want to strive for is integration, where they get to bring a part of themselves and their own culture and mix it with the culture of the United States and kind of that integration. Now, in terms of the common challenges, it's really gonna depend on the individual and their lived experience. But what I can say, I kind of highlighted a few of these things, but I'll highlight it again. Some of the common things that um, we have seen are the cost of living, um, is making sure that they're, they're understanding the cost of living. Um, in particular, in the past, when we've worked with um, Ukrainian populations, those that are coming through um, the, the typical refugee emissions program, they might be from uh, uh, former Soviet Union countries where all the utilities um, for bills were paid. Um, and so, you know, they, it's a new concept to pay utility bills. Now, for the Ukrainians that are coming in through the Uniting for Ukraine, I can't say that that's going to be the same thing, but that's an example of the cost of living, like really understanding what's in a budget in the United States. Um, you know, there's your rent, your utilities, all those different costs that might be slightly different from where they came from. Um, employment is another big one, um, especially depending on their background, their career background, their employment history. It can be kind of a double edged thing. You can have um, groups that had really rich professional experience, but it might be in a field that will require certification, will require um, that they're not going to be able to enter right away when they come to the United States. And part of that also has to do with not only the certification, but building a work history. So I think that's another piece that um, tends to be something that's um, important to um, kind of address. Um, technology is actually another piece I would put in there. We take, I think sometimes we take for granted how digitized everything in everyday life is. Um, a couple years ago, we actually did a panel with some formerly resettled refugees and we had someone who was from Ukraine and she said, oh, I thought I used a lot of technology before I came to the United States. She said, but I use way more now. She's like, I'm on my email all the time. I'm on Facebook. She's like, I have all the Google apps. And so even though um, there is what we're seeing from initial reports, the Ukrainian population is highly, you know, has a lot of access to technology, very digitally savvy. There's a lot of, um, lot, there might be a lot more that they will need to encounter. And we also want to be careful about fraud, safety, and protection of confidential information and making sure that they're not falling victim to anything um, fraudulent, because oftentimes that does kind of pop up um, in these spaces. So I think those are a few things that I would um, highlight in addition to what I already shared. 
Thank you, Jamie. And um, I don't know, you, you just mentioned, I know that we've talked about Afghans, we, refugees, we've talked about other refugees. Can you tell us a little bit more, expand upon what you just said about Ukrainian newcomers, what their experience has been, what you've observed or heard? Yeah, I, I will say that mine has been, um, it's interesting because prior to the, um, you know, the current conflict, the current crisis, Ukrainians were being resettled through what's called the Lautenberg program, which is um, based on religious persecution cases. And oftentimes um, the Ukrainians that were coming in had a U.S. tie. So they had a family member or um, a close family member who was already here in the United States. So most of the experience I've had has been with that population, which is gonna be slightly different than um, those that are coming in currently. Um, that population, as I said, a lot of them are coming from former Soviet Union where they, you know, there's different, um, they're, they're, there's different kind of bills and different kind of pieces. Um, I would say, like I said, from the initial, what I'm seeing from initial reports about the parolees that are coming in, a lot of it's gonna be um, women and children, um, which does take a very different approach um, and can be very challenging. Cause for example, childcare could be something that comes up, you know, who's taking care of the kids, school enrollment. Um, these are some of the, the pieces that might be more important. So you also wanna think about the dynamics in that way. So I, I don't want to speak too broadly on those different populations, but those are some of the the, the pieces that I've um, I've heard through. Um, a lot of times they've been in communities where there's a lot of other Ukrainians, um, and I think that that can help um, quite a bit um, as well. And um, you and I have worked together a long time, and so and Core does fabulous work. I wanted to ask you before we turn to our Q&A and, and thank you everyone who's entering them and we've been able to answer a lot of them, but I, I people often don't talk about the cultural orientation. And yeah. so I just wanted to ask you a few more questions because when we start to sponsor, we often are thinking in terms of, well, really <laughs> the necessities. Yeah. Like who's gonna pick them up at the airport? Where yep. are they gonna live? We gotta stock the pantry. We gotta get kids to school, all of that. How do you recommend or at what point, and then how do you recommend that we as sponsors and we as well mm -hmm. start to integrate and think about this aspect of it much sooner? Yeah, yeah I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look over here real quick because I'm going to pull up a resource that I think will be great for this group. Um, and that is, um, it's a great question. So cultural, and here's the other thing I would say about cultural orientation. Cultural orientation is a continuous and ongoing process. So to your point, a lot of times we might frame it as, okay, I'm going to do, a, this is coming from like a resettlement background, right? I'm going to come and I'm going to deliver this cultural orientation class. And we're going to talk about housing, employment, money management, you know, X, Y, Z, and we're going to spend two hours. Now for sponsors and for those who are reselling maybe like a family or maybe one person that are, are assisting, you're not just going to sit and do kind of a teaching classroom kind of cultural orientation, but you can deliver messaging about cultural orientation through lots of different touch points, including the airport pickup, including that sort of initial, here's your, your new home. Um, and one thing that we've done is we've actually created um, a toolkit, and I think I can share screen, um, or maybe I'll drop the link here and I'll just walk through it. Um, so this toolkit actually provides, I don't know if you guys are able to pull that up on the screen, but it provides a step-by-step -step guide of how to incorporate cultural orientation, messaging, and activities into different services you may be providing as a sponsor. So for example, if you have found them a housing, right, and you want to go over and do a housing orientation, um, you know, there's an activity on here about a scavenger hunt, about what's in my house to make sure they've identified all the different pieces. Now you might want to adjust the scavenger hunt based on their ability. Like sometimes we have populations, maybe they're not used to, you know, using a garbage disposal. So we'll, we'll go through kind of that piece. So, um, if you go to the second page, um, there's a nice little graphic that shows the different, um, 
activities. Perfect. So this document really outlines all the different ways and different activities on how you can deliver cultural orientation topics. And cultural orientation includes everything, Denise, like what you were describing from you know, getting used to your new home, understanding um, what assistance is available to you. Um, there's, um, if you scroll down a little bit more, there's enrollment into English programs, um, enrollment into employment programs, how to make a family budget. So this is a really great resource to kind of understand different ways that you can incorporate cultural orientation. If you click on, for example, transportation orientation, you can click on that um, the actual um, where it says transportation orientation number 19. And that will hop you down to an activity. So then it gives you step by step. Okay, how did you travel in your country of origin? Or, you know, how did you travel in Ukraine? You know, or how did you get around? Um, yeah, Ukraine. And then you explain, okay, in this area, this is the mode of public transportation if they're in an area. And have you used public transportation since arriving? You know, how did you use it? Can kind of make it interactive. And then we can talk through the different types of public transportation. Um, they could use a settle in app. So the settle in app and the website are currently in Russian, um, but we will be adding Ukrainian. I think that was one of the questions that came through. So this is, uh, Denise, I think this is a great tool that sponsors could use and kind of pick and choose you know, based on um, who they're working with, which activities, which topics they might want to um, utilize. And then in addition to that toolkit, there's a more broad page that talks about um, other resources for sponsors, including, um, you know, resources for the newcomers understanding the different settle-in website, how they can use those. Um, and I think that that's a great resource. So I wouldn't think of cultural orientation as something as like a standalone. It's something that could be incorporated throughout the process. Um, and a lot of times we talk about it in the first 90 days, but honestly, cultural orientation goes way beyond 90 days. There's always something new to learn about a new community. So, um, Jamie, thank you. And, and so I have a few questions and um, yeah. some of the staff at Welcome are actually Ukrainian American. Yeah. So they, they have some uh, very interesting perspective on what is that, you know, like these cultural differences that you were talking yeah. about. And um, I just wanted to, to like, to make that real for everybody, because again, yeah. this, a lot of this is around uniting for Ukraine. And, um, and I don't know so much if it's an answer, just like a discussion, like this is very real. This is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So for example, in Ukraine, many children in Ukraine, they walk to school and go to, sto go to stores on their own from a very young age. Women don't typically shake hands. Women get very dressed up. And then you come to the United States and there's a different sort of culture. So what are, like, how do you help sponsors navigate those sorts of cultural differences? Mm -hmm. So in terms of, like, for example, the, the, on the school, like going to school, like the education. So this is where that toolkit's really helpful. A lot of times when we start conversations about different topics, we start from a place of what was the experience like from where, where, where you're coming from, right? So I think that is the first thing is that we never want to make assumptions and you always want to be curious and you want to ask questions of like, you know, how was it going to school? And you, again, you have to, you still have to keep in mind that sort of trauma informed lens and making sure that we, as you're asking questions, you're considerate of what it might trigger. Um, but so you, they might answer, oh, well, my kid used to walk to, you know, walk to school. And then that's an opening to say, okay, well, here where we live in this community, school's actually quite far. So your ki your student, your kid's not going to be able to walk to school, but this is how they're going to get to school. What questions do you have about that? What concerns? So I think it's all about having a dialogue where you ask those questions. Um, in terms of um, the handshake with the, the, you know, if they're, I, I think, again, that goes into um, kind of having an opening conversation about what are some customs? How do people greet each other? That's one of the first things we do a lot of times in cultural orientation class. We might ask a question, oh, how do you say hello? Um, how do you greet someone in your country? What's that look like? What are the differences? What have you observed? And so I think a lot of it is about engaging in conversations and creating um, a sort of level of curiosity, but that's also going to come from establishing trust. So I think those first days are going to be really critical in addressing those really basic initial immediate needs and making sure that they know that those are going to be met and then kind of incorporating these conversations and making sure they know they can always ask you questions and also being really 
lean into if, if you don't have the answer, say, you know what, I'm really, I don't have the answer to that, but I'll, I'll see what I can do to find the answer. So I think that's the other piece is there's a level of humility that you might not have all the answers and you might make some mix, missteps. Um, I think that and that happens when you're with it, when you're having any relationship. So I think those are some of the things is also to give yourself some grace as well. And I like what you said. Um, just like any form of volunteering or sponsoring, it starts from a place of tell me about you. What, yeah. what like what was school like there? Well, this is what school's like here. I wouldn't recommend it, but how can we do this together? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, um, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this very specific question, mm -hmm. um, but um, we will follow up afterward. Uh, do you, do you know where we can find reliable resources on Ukrainian culture? Um, yeah. and, and then also, if you wouldn't mind putting the links in again for a lot of your toolkits, people are saying, we want to see them. We want to see yeah. them. Really, yeah. Really, um, helpful for people. So we're actually working on a Ukrainian backgrounder. I actually have a draft that I need to review, um, probably tomorrow morning. So we're hoping, to, unfortunately, that's not going to help you at the present moment. Um, but I, um, I will take a look. I know there's some additional resources that have been uh, put into that, um, and I can share those afterward. I don't know if you guys do a follow-up email out. Um, but yeah, so we are working on a Ukrainian backgrounder, and the way that we do our backgrounders is we give kind of history, context, language, but then we also provide tips on how to address different topics. So we actually have a couple subject matter experts that are working on that, that piece. Um, so Unfortunately, I won't be able to give too many tips right now, but we do have that resource coming. Um, the other thing I would add to that is, um, oh, it's escaped me. Um, but yeah, I think we do have that, that, that resource coming. Um, and if I can think of the other thing that came to me, I'll, I'll come back to it. Well, I will also say there are a number, as we all know, Ukrainian American organizations with whom we both yes. partner. So we can also share that information after. But I, I would like to also point out that um, Ukrainian Independence Day is coming up. It's around August 24th, and there will be um, a number of events around that. So this is really an opportunity for community members, sponsors, volunteers, just welcomers to get involved in with Ukrainian culture and, and, and immerse themselves in, in finding ways to welcome. Oh, yeah, I did remember what the other thing I was going to bring up language because that's actually because I, I, I saw there's the questions about the Ukrainian and Russian. So one thing that um, is, I think, uh, we, we sometimes get questions, oh, why, why are you guys providing and we're working on we're going to be expanding um, settle in to have Ukrainian, we already have Russian, and we've been getting questions, oh, wh why do you have Russian? Why don't you already have Ukrainian? And um, I think something that's important um, that I've seen is that um, some individuals who are coming from the Eastern region might be more comfortable in Russian than in Ukrainian. And then the other thing that I've uh, seen is that um, from the language perspective is that a lot of times, because a lot of what we do is in digital spaces and looking at how people use the websites, how they search for things. Um, and often Ukrainians aren't um, aren't used to Ukrainian translation, so they'll default to searching for things in Russian. So this is another thing kind of going to your point about how to learn about the different cultures. I mean, language in and of itself is kind of an interesting thing. You know, um, I think it's a, a safe assumption that they, they all speak Ukrainian, but we have had reports where, oh, a Russian interpreter would have been better to use. They're more comfortable in Russian. Um, so that's just another, that was the other like kind of loose strand that I had I wanted to share with the group is around the language piece. I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up um, because of the language sensitivities, um, mm -hmm. particularly around, there are a number of Ukrainians who might speak Russian and Ukrainian and, and, and such sensitivities. I, I see that we're almost to time. Is there any last piece of wisdom you'd love to leave with us? So sorry, my dogs have started to bark. And so I'm trying to get them to quiet down. I apologize. Oh, 
Okay. Um, my last piece of advice, I think kind of goes to your, the, your question about reposting the links. So I'll definitely drop the links in and I'll also share them um, in a follow up email so you guys have all of them. I think my last piece of advice is about following the, the resources. I think there's a lot of information. There's a lot of resources out there. And I think it's just about being curious and exploring those options and seeing what's available so you can be prepared. But I also will tag on to that is that be prepared for the, that you're not gonna be prepared. I think is, I know that that's probably could be a little bit anxiety provoking, um, if you're someone like me who likes to plan and have all the answers and be really prepared, I think the, the best advice is that you I research, learn as much as you can, really kind of really understand, but also be prepared that things that you had not even thought of might come up. Um, and that's okay too. So I think those are my the kind of final piece of advice I would um, provide to the group. Thank you, Jamie, so much for attending and for um, sharing all of your advice and expertise with us. Um, we will be circulating um, the um, links to the toolkits. And again, I love that this is the final webinar in our series because it really does help us see that it starts with understanding who a newcomer is, why they might be coming here, all the nuts and bolts of helping um, people be set up for success, both the sponsor and the newcomer, but also understanding that there are cultural orient, there is cultural integration that happens, and that there is um, this cultural orientation is woven throughout from the very beginning into the end, and that there is no right answer. But again, as you say, that mindfulness and that good intent is so it goes so far. Um, I'd love to um, thank everybody again for attending today. All of our uh, recordings are available on the welcome.us YouTube channel. This is um, number six of six on how to be a sponsor. Please do um, go to um, ukraine.welcome.us to find more tools and tips and resources on um, how to be a sponsor and how to sign up at Uniting for Ukraine. Thank you, everybody.